Good morning. Uh, one more time on uh, Kripke, uh, Kripke's Wittgenstein today, and uh, then we'll go on to Pryor's article, um, the runabout inference ticket. Pryor's article is a classic. It's only two pages long. Is that right? Two pages? Three pages? Something like that. Um, but. <laughs> Um, but it's completely unforgettable. Um, okay, I want to begin with um, just looking over something that I think is definitely established. Wittgenstein's negative point that I think is definitely established by what's happened so far. And uh, then look at what his positive picture of language and meaning is according to Kripke. So um, a natural picture to have of what's going on when you're understanding a language, when you're understanding the words in a language, is that the meaning of a word is this contribution to the meaning of sentences containing it, and then the meaning of a sentence is uh, fixed by when that sentence is true or false, right or wrong. So um, the meaning of a word will be exhausted by the way it contributes to making, contributes to making the sentence right or wrong. So then you get the notion of semantic value, that uh, semantic value is how the term contributes to determining the truth or falsity of a sentence containing it. So for a name, the semantic value of the name would be the object, and then whether any sentence containing that name is true will depend on how things are with the object, and the semantic value of a predicate would be a map from objects onto truth or falsity. So if you've, got the na if you've got the sentence Raleigh smokes, you've got two terms there, you've got the name Raleigh, and its semantic value is? Raleigh, Raleigh. very good. And um, the uh, predicate smokes has a semantic value, a map from objects onto truth value, truth values. What is that map, class? Is this the map that takes an object that smokes onto true, and an object that does not smoke, onto oh. false. Very good. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, Gödel, we'll refer to Gödel, is human will be true of an object just when that thing is human. For not, we have a truth table. Um, and then the general negative point here is that Suppose you try working with this picture and you say, I'm going to tell you how to use the term given that you know the truth, the semantic values of, um, or, 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 the given that you know its semantic value, you're going to know how to use the term. Well, consider someone who's not capable of logical reasoning. And then you say, okay, I'm just going to give you the truth tables for a whole bunch of signs like and, and or, and if then. Will, that, will you then be able to work out how to use the terms? Suppose you don't know any logic. You aren't able to do any inferring. You don't know the input and output rules for um, logical terms. Then if you're given a whole bunch of truth tables specifying the semantic values for terms like and and or, will you be able to figure out what the, how to use the terms? Put your hand up if you think the answer is yes. Put your hand up if you think the answer is no. What a good class. <laughs> okay. right. You see why the answer is no. Put your hand up if you know why the answer is no. Or if you think you know why the answer is no. Okay, that's a bit less convincing. But, okay. <laughs> because, I mean, in this case, it's, it's really stark. It's really very simple. Um, if you don't already know how to use the inference rules for and and or and so on, then you can't do the inferences. You can't do any kind of derivation. The question is, can you derive how to use a term from these um, truth tables? And you can't do any kind of derivation at all if you don't already know the rules of inference for at least some um, logical constants. So if you take a pattern of use like this from A, if you got A and you got B, then you can infer A and B, and if you got A and B, you can infer A, and you got A and B, you can infer B. You can't actually derive that kind of thing from the truth table. 
You've got to be able to do that kind of thing first before you can even make sense of the truth table. Yeah? So the classical picture would be something like, the natural picture really, or it would be something like, I know what it is for all the sentences of my language to be true or false. I know how each term contributes to making those sentences true or false. And then I can derive that. But in fact, you can't, in general, derive the use of a term from its semantic value. I think that's one aspect of Wittgenstein's main point here. I mean, Wittgenstein's challenge is, what does it come to that you know that a term like is tall applies to something if it's tall? What does it come to that you know that map from objects to truth values here? Well, what could it come to? All it could come to is you've got the words, um, it applies to something if it's tall, or you get an image of something tall running through your head. But the image could be interpreted in endlessly many ways. The string of words could be interpreted in endlessly many ways. So, um, that it, whatever you think the knowledge of semantic value here is, it can't be something that you, you would use to derive your ability to apply the word in particular cases. So this is just a parallel point for a predicate like tall or the thing about truth tables. You couldn't derive how to apply the word in particular cases from knowledge of semantic value. Kripke's way of putting it is a little bit different, but you can, I think it's the same basic point. You could say, um, well, you use uh, is tall in such a way that the map um, is from uh, an object to um, true if that object's tall. Otherwise, it's in the maps to false. Um, but how do you know that in the past that's how you, you were using it? Um, if you used it that way and I used it to mean stall, where something's tall and it's before or Wednesday the 7th of November and um, weighs 150 pounds, if it's after the 7th of November, then the way I'm using the term will have, what I'll have had in my head up until today will have matched everything that was in your head. Um, so there's nothing in your head from which you can derive what the right use of the word today is. So there's nothing in our heads that's going to make it the case that we're using the term in one way rather than another. Really the ground floor facts are about the rightness or wrongness of particular whole statements. We actually do agree in our verdicts in particular whole statements, but that's not based in anything. That's not based in knowledge of semantic value. So knowledge of semantic value is really this thing that you hope you could derive whether your judgments about whether this one's tall or that one's tall from your judgment of semantic value, but this is the thing that keeps dropping out. Or you might say it's some bit of language running through your head, but that's the thing that keeps dropping out. It's just your use of the terms in particular cases that is basic. Okay, that's what I think we've got to so far. That's Wittgenstein's correct. It seems to me negative point. I mean, <laughs> I would welcome it if you could find a way of showing that's wrong, um, because it really makes life very difficult. But um, it seems to me very powerful. This. Any questions about that? Okay. So then the question is, how should we think about getting it right or wrong on your use of language? Because the picture I just said is wrong is really the natural picture. Um, how can there be such a thing as getting it right or wrong in your use of language if that notion of knowing what's true or knowing the semantic value of a term just drops out? Um, Kripke gives, I think, the... Um, how should I say? It's, it's very simply stated, and it's the best articulated, explicit version account of what Wittgenstein's picture is. But it really is... It's pretty mind-blowing. It's very hard to believe, th th this account. So let's just work through this. Here's Kripke giving Wittgenstein's positive picture of how language works. Wittgenstein holds with the skeptic that there is no fact as to whether I mean plus or quas. Okay, so Kripke's saying that's right. 
Wittgenstein thinks that's right, he, Kripke, is going to say, I think that's right. There is no fact about as to whether you mean plus or quas. We're going to give up the attempt to find any fact about me in virtue of which I mean plus rather than quas, and then go on in a certain way. Put up your hand if you find that kind of surprising. <laughs> That's devastating, right? Read it again. <laughs> there is no fact as to whether you mean plus or quas. That means, I mean, it's not just plus or quas, right? There are endlessly many substitutes you could make for quas there. There is no fact about you meaning one thing rather than another by your use of a sign. So we're going to give up the attempt to find any fact about you in virtue of which you mean one thing rather than another. And you can see why he says that, because what I keep saying is the negative argument here seems very, very powerful. But how can that conclusion be correct? There's no such thing as meaning one thing rather than another. Put your hand up if you think that's fairly straightforward. What's up there on the screen? That seems clearly correct. Wow. Okay. Um, and if, if it seems surprising at least. Okay. <laughs> well, if you find that fairly straightforward, could you... How come that's straightforward? It's okay to agree with it. Um, I, I just want you to get what it is. That, I mean, it's okay to agree with this. I just want you to get what, be sure that you don't agree with it lightly, if you see what I mean. Oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> okay, Kripke says we have to forget the, plant, the idea of looking for facts here about whether you mean one thing rather than another. All we can do is consider how we actually use, first of all, the categorical assertion that an individual is following a certain rule, and secondly, the conditional assertion. If the individual is following such and such a rule, then they must do so and so on a given occasion. So every, every point here is important. This is key to getting what the positive picture is supposed to be. We are not going to look for facts. We are just going to consider how we actually use statements like the categorical assertion that an individual is following a certain rule. That is, for example, the categorical assertion that Sally is using the cross to mean addition. That is what we actually say. And we're going to consider um, in what context we actually say if the individual follows such and such a rule, they must do so on a given occasion. So, for example, in what context do we actually say if Sally means addition by plus, then she ought to say 57 plus 68 is 125. So these are not expressing facts, one and two there. All we're going to do is consider how we actually use those kind of remarks. The categorical assertion that the individual is following the rule and the conditional rule, that if they're following the rule, they must do such and such. They must say 125. So we're not looking for facts that make it true that someone means plus by the cross. And we're not going to look for facts that make it true that if someone means a plus by the cross, then they should say 125 when asked for the answer to 67, 68 plus 57. Yep. Does this only help us insofar as um, the categorical assertion doesn't make reference to past in the sense that it, 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 if she means, or if Sally is using plus to mean addition right now? Uh, I think that's, I think it doesn't matter whether it's present tense or past tense, if that's the question. Sally w is using plus or Sally was using plus. I think Kripke's negative thing would apply in either case here. Uh, 
I see. Um, the, the, well, I think I see. The, 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 there's something here that I, I didn't really emphasize that's, very, that's written very large if you read the Kripke, which is, he talks about how would you know which in the past you were using? Right. Were you using plus to mean quas, or were you using plus to mean quas? Right? Um, but at the end of the day, the point is not about what you know. The point is, there's nothing to know. Yeah? And that's really what's going on here. It's not that um, there's a fact about... Uh, uh, well, <laughs> it's not that there's a fact about whether you mean plus or quas. Only it's very difficult to figure out. Yeah? It's that there's no fact here. There's nothing to know. Right. Um, well, what it, well, the thing is, um, the categorical assertion looks like it's stating a fact, and it must be just one that's very hard to know. But the idea is we are going to give up on that. Wittgenstein holds with the skeptic that there is no fact as to whether you mean plus or quas. Whether you mean plus or quas now, or whether you meant plus or quas in the past. It's really it's, 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 it sounds, some, there's something about Kripke's exposition that makes it sound a, more innocuous than it is. This is what I mean. If you get this, your hair should be standing on end. Yeah? This is a really startling idea. Yeah? Um, and it's only even worth considering because the argument for it seems so forceful. It, yeah? But he really means that. It's not that you don't know now or in the past. There was nothing to know. Does that? I, it just seems like the categorical assertion is trying to, that, that is the fact Sally is using plus to be an addition. That yeah. seems to me like a factual statement. It seems like it, yeah. But there are other cases. Right? I'll talk in a bit about responsibility, for example. People say, um, uh, who was responsible for um, uh, the stone going through that window, you say, right? Who was responsible? Well, that notion of responsibility, when you look for facts about who's responsible for what out there in the physical world, they are very hard to find, right, out there in physics. So um, one reaction people have is to say, well, these facts about who ought to do what, who's responsible for what, who's to blame for what, they're not really facts about the world at all. They're expressions of an attitude to the world. Yeah. Um, and there are cases where it's very clear. Uh, um, um, uh, if you say good morning, good morning is not a report. I mean, <laughs> if you're learning a language, you can just make a mistake and think that when people are saying good morning, they actually mean something about how nice the weather is. Yeah. But that's just a mistake. Um, uh, on the other hand, there are languages where people greet each other with a report as to how the weather objectively is. Yep. You see what I mean? So when you say good morning, it literally does mean good morning. But when you're asking how we use the greeting good morning, it would just be a mistake to look for the fact as to whether it's a good morning. All you could do would be to say, um, ask, uh, when is it right to say good morning? In what context do you say good morning? Something can look like fact stating uh, language when it's not. And the idea that is that this, the categorical assertion that the individual is following a certain rule, the idea that Sally is using plus to mean addition, that looks like fact-stating language, but it's not. It's to be classified with um, uh, moral judgments on that kind of um, view of them, or statements like good morning, or maybe just giving someone a round of applause. If you give someone a round of applause, there's no fact you're stating there, but if someone who wants to know, wants to know what's going on when you're applauding, then um, you just, all you can do is consider the context in which you actually do applaud. It's not that you, I mean, it's not fact stating, you're not so reporting some fact when you applaud, but um, it's not either that you just applaud whenever you like. There are contexts, 
<laughs> well, you can applaud whenever you like right here. <laughs> but but um, there are contexts in which um, is right to applaud and contexts in which is completely inappropriate. Uh, so these statements, X means plus by the cross, or if he means plus by the cross, then he should say 125 when asked for the answer to 68 plus 57. Um, we're not to look for facts that make that true. We're just asked, um, when is it right to say these things? So if you're saying of a child, um, if the child's learning how to use the word plus, and at a certain point, they use it often enough that you say, um, uh, by George, she's got it. Um, then um, what you're doing, and now she means plus by the cross, um, then what you're doing there is really a kind of applause. When you make that categorical remark, it would actually not be a bad model to think of this. Sally is now using plus to mean addition as a kind of applause that you give the child. You say, you're one of us. You've made it in. Welcome. Uh, something like that. You're not actually stating a fact about what's going on, right? That, 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 that really is the model here. Um, so the contrast here is, Kirky says, a strict solution to the skeptic would point out something that the skeptic overlooked. It would say, when you're trying to say, what well, constitutes my meaning plus rather than quas, or what constitutes my meaning uh, successor, or tall, or what constitutes my meaning these things. You can't say it's something running through your stream of consciousness. You can't say um, it's some, some other definition you have. Uh, but maybe there's something, maybe it's some pattern of neural firing or something. And the, the, the straight solution would try to find that hidden fact that makes it the case that you mean one thing rather than another. So that's a straight solution. But Kripke says a straight solution is impossible. The skeptical problem is really uh, uh, that intractable. The skeptical solution doesn't allow you um, to think of a single individual considered by themselves and in isolation as ever meaning anything. There's no hidden fact that would allow a single individual to mean plus rather than quas one thing rather than anything other, is rather this. If an individual fails to come up with the particular responses that the community regards as right, then we don't applaud. Then we say, you haven't got it. You haven't got it that plus means quas. Um, on the other hand, if the child passes enough tests, if the child gives the right, the same answers as the rest of us on enough occasions, then after a fair amount of this, after we've checked back and forth and been sure that we're getting the same answers, um, uh, then we will accept that you've got it. Now, you know, now you've got it, we say. Now you know that what plus means. Um, and that will allow us to trust them in engaging in further interactions with them. We might trust them to count out the change if, they are, if we're buying something from them. We trust them to engage in interactions that involve counting and addition. So once we get a certain um, uh, amount of uh, actual responses that we agree on with our individual, then we'll say, you got it, you mean plus. Uh, you mean addition when you're using the plus sign. Um, and we'll trust them to agree with us further. But that's all that's going on. And you can't convert that into an account of the facts that make it true that someone is go is, is, means one thing rather than another. Because them agreeing with us on any bunch of fi uh, any finite number of responses is consistent uh, with us all going different ways past that initial finite set. So if you look for a fact here that makes it true that we all mean the same thing, that would just be subject to the same argument that we keep hammering away at. Um, rather, all that's going on is 
the, the subject agrees with everyone else on a certain, up to a certain point, and then we say, welcome, we applaud, uh, we accept you as meaning addition by the plus sign, and we welcome you in and, agree, and engage in further interactions with you. Um, community rules do not kill yeah. and someone understands it to the point where we accept him and then suddenly he kills a man in a gray suit and to yeah. him it's always been do not kill do not kill yeah. you can't punish him can we? that's right when, it, when you said do not kill I, I, I meant quill <laughs> right. uh, 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 yeah what, what I thought I was agreeing with was do not quill uh, right um, well uh, I think the line here would be that, uh, I, I think that's important actually, the extending this into thinking about how this applies to the moral case. Um, but all you could do here, I think, is describe what actually happens. And what actually happens is that if this person says, ah, but by kill I meant quill, right? Then we are still going to, um, we are not going to say, ah, well, that explains everything, right? <laughs> um, at that point, we either, um, uh, just lock them up, or we say, here we have a hitherto unknown form of madness. Uh, yeah, and, and we, but we take it very seriously either way. Yeah, so um, the, 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 there's this basic point uh, that the success of this just depends on this brute empirical fact that we agree with each other in our responses. This kill quill thing doesn't happen very often. That's, all, that's the only reason it works. We just do keep on going in the same way. So these practices of applauding after a certain point and welcoming people in, um, they work. But there's nothing, there's, n there's nothing that's making it work. It is just a brute empirical fact that it does work. Yep. Right. That is how you naturally think of it. Right. Something happened and the child got Something it. Something happened in the child. But, um, presumably, in the future, the child will not behave as he did before, before that child Yeah. So, it might not be that, um, do we have to see the child do the same thing over and over and over again for us to say that's the case? Or, do we rely on the fact that Yeah, the the whole thrust of the negative uh, part of Wittgenstein's discussion is to attack that idea of the change that went on in the child, and to say that just doesn't matter any change that went on in the child. All that matters is what the child does next, and the simple way to see it is: suppose the child suddenly heard, "Oh, of course, now I get it." You, you meant addition, right, or whatever is meant to be going on there. Um, if the child then goes on in a deviant way, they haven't got it, no matter what happened at that point, when they banged their head and said, now I get it. Um, and even if that transformation did not happen, you know, there was no point at which the child said, or which the child said, oh, now I get it. But the child actually did start using words in the right way. That, that's all that matters. Yeah. Well, all there is to say about it is um, this kind of thing. If the individual passes enough tests, 
then we'll say you're using plus to mean addition, not quaddition. But that's not, but of course it's true that if you were using quaddition, you'd actually be going on in just the same way. Yeah. But the thing is, we just don't bother about that in practice. In practice, if the child passes enough tests, uses the word right in, the, in enough cases, gives the right answer to enough addition sums, we say, you've got it, welcome in. And then we, then we expect the child to go on agreeing with us, with the rest of us. Um, and that is just the brute empirical fact that we get this agreement in our responses and everything else depends on that. Yep. I think that there's a problem here in that um, like we can have a kid who's just ridiculously lucky and just always seems to get addition right, even without understanding any rule, right. versus a child who understands the rule and properly. And there seems to be a big distinction between those two, and yet on this account, it doesn't. That's, right. that's exactly right. Yeah, that, that's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you'd think there's a distinction between the child that gets it right because they're lucky, and it's just a coincidence they're giving the, the right answers in all these cases, yeah, and the child that uh, gets it right for the right reasons, something like that. Um, and uh, the point here is that you can't make that distinction. Um, getting it, that distinction depends on the, ch the idea that there's such a thing as getting it right for the right reason, right? The, on the right basis. And the point is that when you're in these basic uses of language, there is no basis. The giving of explanations has to come to an end somewhere. Here we hit bedrock and the spade is turned. You can't keep giving explanations all the way down. It just stops rather sooner than you might have expected. Yeah? And if there's no explanation to be given of why you say um, 5 plus 7 is 12, no explanation to be given at all, um, that's just the words you produce, then you can't make that distinction between getting it right for the right reason and uh, it just being lucky that you got it right. Uh, one, two. So, so can, can you take that from the top? I d uh, okay. Yeah. That's something to do with how people acquire skills. Uh -huh. Like being conditioned to do so, right? Yep. Uh, and then my being conditioned and luckily getting it right. So, I mean, I, I don't think of it as like, you know, a negative thing. Like, I think of it as devastating, I guess, um, because we could study more um, of those examples and give an explanation as to how people learn to pick up um, following roles um, by seeing that there's no Seeing that there's no distinction. Well, I, I'm not sure I really f follow. Um, when we say if, a, if an individual passes enough tests, there's some kind of screening that we do at the start, right, when, you're, when you test the child out in different cases. You know, I, I do that with you guys when I say, what would you say is the semantic value of a truth table of a, of a, of a, of a constant like and or or, right? That's exactly what you're doing, yeah? Um, just uh, where you're saying, can you go on in the same way? Um, but um, after a reasonable number of cases, you know, you or I presumably have been through enough testing of our ability to add that anyone would say, okay, they've got it. Yeah. And that's all there is. There's no basis separating you and me. All that it comes to that we've grasped the technique is that we've given the right answers often enough. I mean, there's no, like, internal basis. There's no what, sorry? Right, there's no internal basis. Investigating the person's mind or into the person in general um, to see, you know, what are the things that they do well, 
That's right. That's a picture. Yeah. That's right. They are following blindly. And when you say it's not devastating, I mean, Wittgenstein and Kripke are going to say, that's right, it's not devastating. Um, that's just what goes on. But it requires that you throw away the picture of there being a fact about you meaning one thing rather than another. Because that, that, that was, what, that, that was the, the work that the internal thing was doing, making it the case that you mean one thing rather than another. Uh, once you throw that away and say, well, I don't see what we can do without that, then um, you lose the, the idea that there's a fact of the matter about meaning plus rather than quas, because all your responses would have been the same if you'd meant quas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Right. That's very good. Um, I think is, is this right? I, I'm not dead sure what to say about that. Someone who seems to understand the word all right but they're actually just quite clumsy in using it. I mean, I don't, I don't mean that. <laughs> I don't mean that negatively. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, I, I guess that, that uh, you would think, well, this notion of passes enough tests has room for some complexity in it. That um, if you say, if we take you in a case where you say one plus two, or oh, that's four, um, and then we say, no, no, wait a minute, go back over that, do it slowly, then you will get it right, um, give you enough time. You, you see what I mean? It makes sense that someone might be kind of panicky around numbers, but um, once you give them enough time, they should be able to get it right, or see their error when it's pointed out to them. Uh, Actually, that's very interesting. It, 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 one thing to do with a child that seems to be getting it right, luckily, maybe one way you could make the contrast there is to try to rattle the child and say, one plus, the child says one plus two, and uh, you, you say one plus two, and the child says three, and you say, no, no, it's four, and then you see if the child stands on the ground, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's kind of fun to do, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, I do. I, I do know what you're saying. The point is, there's nothing deeper in the child for which you're probing. All you're looking at is something relatively superficial. The particular... If you pass the test, you're good. If you pass the test, you're good. The test itself might be a little bit complex, though. It might involve allowing people to correct you or people to challenge you and seeing how well you stand your ground. No. <laughs> I agree. I, no, I, I agree. The, 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 <laughs> your point is perfectly uh, uh, good. That um, well, One of the things that makes it natural to think that we're, he we're probing for something underlying here is that complexity in the tests. But really, um, uh, the whole point of the kripke wittgenstein picture here is to say, we have to take the surface appearances at face value. All that's going on is the stuff in the surface. Just describe that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm actually I, I'm trying to blast through a little bit here. We, we, we could just pause this and, and hold, hold over until next time. But I'm inclined to see if I can get through many of the points I wanted to hear. Um, so this is all right up to this point. I mean, you see what I'm saying anyhow, or what Kripke's Wittgenstein is saying. How about that? And it is pretty wild, I, I agree. If you think that, then I agree. Um, 
Okay, let's see. We may have to hold this over for next time. Um, it doesn't matter much if we do, but let's see. There's a classic uh, puzzle for Wittgenstein's um, um, picture here, which is the idea of a born Crusoe. Um, that's to say, um, well, one way to start getting at it is to say, uh, can't you make sense of a person being right in what he says and everyone else is wrong? Does, doesn't that make sense? Can Wittgenstein make sense of that? But there's also the idea of a born Crusoe, that's to say, um, I mean, you can't literally be born on a desert island, but you, you can assume that you're born um, and um, almost immediately afterwards, um, your mother sails away um, and is never seen by you again, and uh, you spend your life on this desert island. Um, now, that seems to make sense, right? You could have someone who spent uh, the, 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 their life in this desert island, um, making a hut, uh, getting to know the goats, having a little farm, um, and maybe they keep a diary. Maybe, you know, they write their diary and you come upon them, and they, they have to invent their own language, of course, but just by coincidence, it looks just like regular English. Um, and when we pick them up, when the boat finally comes to pick them up, you look at their diary, and it's full of long ruminations. The wretchedness of my life here is unimaginable. Um, uh, 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 and so on. And it looks just like regular English. I mean, doesn't that make sense? Could, couldn't you have someone like that um, outside any of this context of rule follow, following or applause? Of, uh, um, and wh here's what um, Kripke says about this. Kripke says, if we think of Crusoe as following rules, we are taking him into our community and applying our criteria for rule following to him. So that the discussion so far need not mean that a physically isolated individual can't be said to follow rules. It's rather that an individual considered in isolation, whether or not they're physically isolated, can't be said to be following rules. So if you think of saying, oh, he's got it, he means um, addition by the plus sign. If you think of that as a kind of applause, what's going on here is, we're reading Crusoe's journal, and we're saying, by God, look at that. Well done, Crusoe. <laughs> you see what I mean? The um, ascription of meaning to Crusoe is being done in the context of this activity of us regarding him as one of us, saying, look how well the usage matches up to the way we use words. Um, in, so the, the temptation here is always to read Kripke as if he's giving a straight solution to the skeptical problem and saying, what makes it true that uh, Sally means addition by plus is that she gives the responses we agree with in enough cases, or what makes it true that 57 plus 68 is 125, is that we all agree that that's the right answer. Um, but if you try to give that kind of account, it would be hopeless because you run right back into these plus plus problems. And what makes it true that Sally means addition by the plus sign can't be just agreement and some bunch of responses because that would be consistent with our meaning quas by the plus. Um, it would be consistent with us all meaning quas by the plus. Uh, it's rather got to be that we're thinking here of Crusoe in the context of a skeptical solution where we are taking Crusoe in and saying, well, you're one of us. That's all that's going on when you say uh, Crusoe means addition by the plus sign. The striking remark in that by Wittgenstein, if language is to be a means of communication, I think we quoted this earlier, there must be agreement not only in definitions, but also, queer as this may sound, in judgments. Um, so, we don't have very much time, so let me um, so the suggestion here is that what we're doing with statements like x means plus by the cross or if he means plus by the cross x should say 125 we're not looking for facts that make those true um, and it's similar 
to how you'd explain what goes on with good morning or saying when it's right to applaud. You don't describe when it's right to applaud. The, the, these things can should be given a description of um, when it's right to applaud or when it's right to say good morning, but not by giving facts that make them true. And similarly, the use of signs like X means plus by the cross, or if you mean plus by the cross, then you should say 125 when you ask what's 68 plus 57. Um, that, shouldn't be, uh, that, that shouldn't be dealt with. That should be dealt with by saying uh, when it's right to say these things, um, not by looking for facts. Now the thing is, that means that there isn't any fact of the matter about whether it's true that if he means plus by the cross, X should say 125 when asked for the answer to 68 plus 57. Right? That's an implication. There's no fact to the matter about that. If he means plus by the cross, then you should say 125 when asked for the answer to 68 plus 57. So presumably that means that there isn't any fact to the matter about whether 68 plus 7 plus plus 57 is 125. Presumably that's going to have that implication. I mean, if there isn't a fact of the matter about whether it's true, the 68 plus 57 is 125, given the meanings of the signs, then how can there be a fact of the matter about whether 68 plus 57 is 125? So if you say there aren't facts of the matter about meaning, it seems that you're coming, you're going to have to say, that there aren't any facts of the matter about anything at all. And that point applies to language generally. You could put just in just anything there, um, and there wouldn't be a fact of the matter about whether it's true, given the meanings. So there wouldn't be a fact of the matter about um, whether the thing itself is so. No. I don't know that it's a posteriori. The a posteriori would suggest there is a fact of the matter, but you just have to use your senses to find out about it. Yeah. Um, but it's not something special about maths. It's something. It's something about anything you can talk about. So maths is In this. Uh, again. It's, it's a little bit mind-bending what's going on here. When you talk about a social construction, that suggests there's a fact to the matter about what we're talking about. We're just talking about this social construction. You see, it, it wouldn't be right to say good morning is a social construction. It's just, <laughs> it's not a thing at all. Uh, that's not the right way to think of it. So what's going on here is that we're losing the notion of a fact. Uh, uh, there could be facts about a social construction, if you see what I mean. This isn't, <laughs> it doesn't even have the dignity of a social construction. Yeah. Um, uh, it looks as though what's happening is that we're losing the very existence of a fact stating use of language. And on that bombshell, <laughs> <laughs>